uh, it was a lot of fun detailing the the lawsuit that I think dealt them the 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 final blow. The military guy and his and his his uh, missing car. Yes, but I don't know if 911 owners are fans of that car because they're fans specifically of Germany and German culture and food and locations and travel I, and stuff I like mean, that. I mean Casual observation, I'm going to say probably not. Yeah. Hey, folks, welcome to the Smoke and Tire podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Off the Record. They have been around uh, taking care of us for a long time, and they can take care of you, too. OTR is a service that helps you fight tickets. You get a ticket, it's bullshit. Get that ticket, call OTR. Don't call. Go to offtherecord.com slash TST or download the Off The Record app and use code TSTPOD. Off The Record will set you up with a qualified attorney in the jurisdiction where you got the ticket. Fight that ticket for you. You don't have to do anything else. If it's court, they'll go to court. If it's prop meeting with the prosecutor, they do all of that. And if they don't get those points off of your record, you get your money back. You don't Pay. I've used them multiple times. Incredible success. I love OTR. I tell them, I tell everybody about them. And uh, and now I'm telling you. So off the record.com slash TST or use code TST10 on the off the record app for iOS and Android. That'll get you 10% off all services with OTR in perpetuity. And we love them. So you should use them. All right, folks, on today's episode, our pal Ryan Zumalin is in studio. He's got a new book out called Cult of GTR. We're talking about Skylines. It's the all Skyline hour on this one. What is it about the Skyline that makes it so coveted in America? What are some of the myths uh, and crazy stories about what people have done to get Skylines into this country? What do they like to drive? What are the people like who collect them? Um, it's one of the most interesting cars subcultures out there and uh, Ryan's book Cult of GTR available on newsstands now or wherever you get books not Amazon don't buy your books on Amazon buy your books from better places than that um, it's a great book both Zach and I have read it it's really entertaining and uh, we're tell we're giving it away today on the smoking tire podcast with Ryan Zumalin author of the cult of GTR hello everybody Hello to our live patrons who are listening. Hello to everyone who's asked question. And to my friend Ryan. Hey. Who's in studio and wrote an awesome book, which both Zach and I read, uh, The Cult of GTR. And uh, it's a great title because you, the way you make it uh, sound, it's like a fucking cult. Uh, but you also made me want to get another goddamn GTR. Yep. <laughs> People call me an expensive friend. You're a fucking expensive friend. It cost me 200 G's over here. Apologize. Yeah. Um, it, is a, it is a cool book, A True Story of Crime, Obsession, and the World's Most Coveted Car. And uh, all of those are uh, actually mentioned. I had uh, a few people take issue with the most coveted car thing. But, um, yeah, to me, it was it was kind of obvious. I didn't. I mean, uh, I think there's, there's like, desirable or, sure. or whatever word you want to use. But as far as, like... Coveted to me means like the lengths that you're willing to go to, and and in that sense, I thought. I yeah, thought I mean, it's an aggressive it. term, but it's not. It's it's like you could say it's like mild puffery, but yeah. like it's not like it's not true. I yeah. mean, in 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 the book, do you talk about multiple established businesses that exist to find loopholes and to to set up shop and to 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 do certain types of paperwork and certain types of procedures, essentially just around bringing this car. I mean, from from the fully, fully above board businesses to the very shady ones, to the ones where people have gone to jail or been forced into hiding, it's all around Skylines. There's no yeah. other car in the history of cars have people gone so far to get them across borders in a gray way. Right. Yeah, and partly because only in the last thirty years has it been as difficult as it is right. to actually do it. Right. I didn't under realize until I read your book that that twenty five year import rule was not like an all the time. Like I, 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 I've taken that as as a for granted. I thought it was just there always. I didn't realize that that started in the eighties. Yeah. So uh, the the common complaint that people like to levy against that law is, oh, Mercedes paid for the law. 
or it's a, or we call that the Mercedes law or whatever. And like, that's true. But Mercedes had tried for years before 1988, when it was enacted to get something like this on the books and it failed. Yeah. Like it was just, it just couldn't really gain traction, any political steam. Um, and it wasn't until they basically got all other automakers and dealers on their side to like really make an effort, um, to to have some political force. Yeah, because like for happening. a long time, if you if you wanted a Mercedes or a Porsche, um, you you either ordered it from Germany or ordered it through, you know, Dave Stevens European Motor Cars. Importers, yeah. You know, a registered import, and you got the the European version of they were the same car, and so maybe they'd convert the speedometer to, to miles an hour, but like it was fundamentally the same car. And it was smarter to do it that way because uh, of the strength of the dollar. Right. You were saving, in some cases, uh, 50%. Right. And then it was only when those European importers, manu- excuse me, European manufacturers decided to set up their own dealer networks in America that they found themselves competing with themselves. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that is where the U.S. sides of that said, hey, you're creating an unfair practice here. Yeah. Um, the consumers were winning, which is not allowed. <laughs> yeah, right. That's not how this is, that's yeah, not how yeah, this is yeah. supposed to work. Yeah. Uh, so, Wait, I'm sorry. You can't use the power of your business to fuck people. <laughs> we need to change that yeah. immediately. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's a, it, a you know, interesting thing about that. There's a, there's a really good book. I can't remember the guy's name, but there's a really good book specifically on the gray market craze of the mm. 1980s and it goes into a lot of detail on like exactly what was going on at the time. Oh, I have to figure well when if you remember you got to tell me I want to put that on my reading list. Okay, for sure. I um, like I love random fucking books like that. You'll you'll nerd out okay. on this for sure. Um but but they mentioned that uh Mercedes was frustrated at the way the American political system works because as much as you can just like you know, by politicians or laws in some cases, it, it's much easier to do that in Germany <laughs> or flex, not buy, this, but this process but, of buying the politicians is not efficient. Yeah. <laughs> we need German I mean, efficiency. Just, that company and German manufacturers oh. are just so perfect. Is that it? Yeah. John Hedge. John thank you. Hedge, the automotive gray market and inside history. Uh, yes. Those German manufacturers are so indelible to the economy in Germany that they can basically flex their muscle and get anything past that they want. And they thought they were going to be able to do that here too. And we're, we're disappointed that that's not how it works. Only American car companies can do that yeah. here. The German <laughs> car companies cannot. There's yeah. a great, on a related note, a great article in the intercooler this week by um, David uh, Twig mm. about how German manufacturers push forward the law that allows larger vehicles to emit more carbon dioxide and everything else. Like the larger the vehicle, the more it's allowed to emit. Yeah. So the same thing, flexing their muscle in Europe. So. Mm-hmm. I mean, similar to what we do with like heavy duty trucks. Yeah, with, with too, trucks, yeah. it's all the same shit. Oh, they're exempt. And yeah. they're just owned by a guy. Yeah. <laughs> it's not even like a work. It's just a... Just a, it's know, just a dude. An F two fifty. Yeah. Um, so so that you know that's sort of how this twenty five year import thing. It was because importers were buying cars in Germany, bringing them to America, and selling them for cheaper than if you went to a Mercedes or a Porsche dealer and could get the U S version as well. Correct. So that's where it started. It was it wasn't that was already going on. Or you said I think it was ten months later they launched the R thirty two Skyline. Yeah. So like that was like pretty much like the first car. To start on its back foot, you know, yeah. like right, the first great car, anyway. which which no one would have expected at the time, yeah. because Japanese cars were still, I think, looked at, even though they had just had a really successful period in the seventies and eighties, they they weren't looked at as serious performance machines mm-hmm. quite yet. Um, that era started, um, you know, huge leaps forward with the Skyline, the Supra, the NSX. But, um, but, uh, uh, but Japan, Nissan so. never, you know, they never intended to make a left-hand drive version of the car. No. It was never really intended for for export anyway, other than to like Australia, and New Zealand. And um, they did that begrudgingly. Yeah, even too. It was this was a Japanese car specifically for for you know Japan. Yeah, but it was like it was such a right place, right time because you have like shows like Best Motoring and you had Option Magazine and you had, you know, a little later stuff like Street Fire and Shave, Torrent websites and and then Gran Turismo 1 that that got a whole generation of kids uh, sort of 
knowing about this unbelievably fast, like mythically fast thing that they couldn't have. Yeah, and could only catch brief glimpses of. Yeah. Like if you knew a way to get a tape from a Japanese touring card championship yeah. or something, then you could then you could see it. Uh, or yeah, like you said, once, uh, you know, ripping software uh, became more prevalent, then you could find like videos of these guys racing down the street and like evading the cops in, yeah. in these like crazy street races. But like it was just little glimpses at a time. Um, Gran Turismo pretty much changed everything. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I think one of the most fascinating things, a lot of, a, a lot of people that I spoke to while I was doing this, um, kind of not dismissed it, but just kind of like labeled it as, well, it's forbidden fruit. So everybody wants forbidden fruit. And I was like, ah, I don't know. It's more than, but no, there's, there's like a more bunch of car. Why, nobody wants a Cedric. Exactly. Like there's a lot of forbidden fruit. It, it has, it's gotta be forbidden fucking gold. Yeah. Like it's, it's forbidden diamond. It's, yeah. it's like, it's not fruit. It's no one like, wants forbidden durian. Yeah. What's well, <laughs> the weird, uh, the weird fruit that just oh, smells yeah. like yeah. Yeah. the rotting one? Yeah. 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 Rotting flesh one. Um, yeah. Cedric is my favorite name for a car. And, by uh, the way. It's like the Nissan Steve. <laughs> That's the best. <laughs> um, but yeah, what, uh, what, one of the most fascinating parts of the research that I found was this uh, study by researchers in Europe that put put two groups of kids together. One was allowed to eat, I think it was candy or like bright cereal or something like that at home. The others were not allowed to eat that. And when they showed them advertisements for that exact kind of food, the ones who were allowed to eat it, you know, were like, oh, that looks good. The ones who were not allowed to eat it, like, wanted it more. Yeah. This explains how I got fat. But it went, wondering. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't allowed to eat food? I was, my mom was like super healthy food at home only. Oh, okay. I couldn't have anything like bad. And my neighbor next to me, who I spent a lot of time at his house, his house was the like the house that was like fucking loaded with unhealthy shit. Yeah. And anyone could just go in and take what it later became the house you could drink at Free and do candy drugs store. at uh. later. Shout out to him. Shout out to my boy. Shout Alex. out to the Gateway House. Shout out to the yeah. Gateway House, the fucking the legendary house. <laughs> but like that being next door, and like it's the same shit. I read that paragraph. I'm like, this is why you're fat. Yeah. yeah. This is this is me in video games. I wasn't yeah. allowed to have a oh, console until really? I was like 13. Yeah. And, and now then it was. Now you've got an R34 it was, Skyline. Yeah, it was Japan. over. <laughs> uh, but um, when they went a little bit further in their research, they found that if okay, you take those same groups of kids and you show the ones who aren't allowed to have it. You show them not just uh, like a like a photo ad, but a video of other kids enjoying this thing that yeah. they're not allowed to have. And something about seeing it on video uh. rewires them or changes their brain chemistry or like makes them react almost in the way a drug addict would act. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I have to have this thing. It makes it it makes it seem like. Not only is it an object, but it's like a lifestyle or a sure. culture or it's something that enhances your life. Well, dude, when we saw as kids, when we saw Best Motoring and the R30, the mines like R34 or whatever was like beating an F40 on a racetrack with some like lunatic Japanese guy screaming and cackling, you know, with like a pedal cam and the perfect heel toe downshifts and like drifting and shit. It's like, no, that. I want fucking that. So that was it. Yeah, right? that was the yeah. jam. The, the, out of all the GTR owners I talked to, that was the single one thing that they all pointed to. Best wow. motoring. Yeah, that's yeah. Sin that one clip yeah. of that mines car. Yeah. Um, so now it's cool to watch them like be coming back and doing these uh, built by legends. The built by legends cars. Did you get cool. to drive one yet? Oh God, no. Oh, you didn't. <laughs> oh, I, I drove, drove it right now. I drove it. Yeah. It's fucking crazy. It's the awesome. The thirty. I drove the thirty two. Okay. And they said I didn't know they they just got another thirty three and the first thirty three sold like right away. Uh -huh. um, I have not gotten to try the the next thirty three, but the thirty two was sick. Uh, the wheels on the thirty two are maybe the coolest looking wheels I've. They're I've, badass. I've ever seen. Yeah. I really, really like those. Um, no, I didn't place a, a huge importance on driving GTRs for this book, mm. which may seem weird or blasphemous. Um, I didn't want to I didn't want to take away from what I thought was like a, a story that deserved to be told um, by like trying to position myself as like, well, here's what you need to know about the dynamics and the way it handles. Like I felt I felt like that had been done. I felt like there were yeah, lots of places you could go. Yeah, exactly. You could go. I mean, what am I going to say that Matt or Zach hasn't no, no, I said just, about it? It's them? more about just for the curiosity. Yeah. I mean, I feel like you'd look at that and go, 
I just wrote a book about this. Yeah. I think having a go it might be nice. That um, you know, one day. Um, I did get to drive recently uh, an R32 that was owned by Hero, who started MotorX. Oh, cool. Um, and that was super cool. And yeah. the guy had a. Uh, you know, old videos of uh, showing him with the car back in the like the late nineties, and um, yeah, man, it's just cool. It's it's cool to like that. So much of this history is like known, but it's whispered about or rumored, and like it's in all these different places. And so, my goal really was to like see how much of it I could verify, see how much new stuff I could bring up, and then put it all in one place. Mm-hmm. Um, because uh, this is a very if you know you know type of story, and uh, I wanted to introduce it to new people, and also give people who were already familiar with it, give them something new and mm-hmm. different and extra. So um, it was it was a blast. It was so much fun to do. It so, was incredibly comprehensive. Like I really yeah. appreciated that you had this, the scientific research in there, of like why do we like these things or why are we drawn to them? Because I find that stuff fascinating. And it's nice to explain the motivation, like the cerebral motivation behind it. And then also you went back to 1800s Japan. Like, I mean, <laughs> yeah. that was when I flipped yeah. that chapter. Like, oh, okay, we're okay. getting the full story we're, of the we're culture, going deep. We're yeah. trade. Yeah. It, but it was it was yeah. great because it colonialism. It, yeah, but it, it lends itself. It yeah. all connects, of course. I think. Yeah. Um, I think that the story of Japan is the story of the Skyline GTR is the story of Japan. Like when Japan is doing well, Nissan is doing well, and a GTR comes out. Mm-hmm. Like. That's how it goes. Right. LS400 came out. Oh, yeah, they made and a lot when, of great things. And when yeah, the yeah. country's not doing well, they're not making those. And when the economy goes down, they stop making GTRs. Um, they really, it's a miracle the R34 exists. Yeah. Nissan was so on its last legs financially at that time. They, they had, it was not financially prudent to produce an R34 GTR uh, with the amount of tech and research and development that they had to put into that thing uh, just to get it from the 33 to the 34. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's, it's just it's just a miracle that that car exists. And so I think to me, that's that's the real appeal of the 34 and like the craze going on right now with prices being insane. Like that car really shouldn't exist. What and, if they had made a left hand drive version? Would that have saved or buoyed the company for a long time? I mean, it, w- it might have just been a smash hit. And, and just gone get, in every market? Yeah, it, it might have. Had it, gone it, every market, I mean, there you know? probably could have been a business case for making that a global car because it wouldn't have been that hard to federalize it. I mean, it would it, it, not on an, an OEM level. It wouldn't have been that hard. And there were probably people – I mean, no, actually, if you go back to 1998, pre-Gran Turismo, mm-hmm. pre-YouTube – Still passing some VHS copies of Best Motoring, but not a lot. You, we may not have had; they may not have foreseen the demand for it globally that there otherwise yeah. is now because of these things that we're not thinking about. Yeah, and not to pour water on the fire, but to put my Nissan executive hat on, I don't know that they could have handled any increased capacity. I don't know mm-hmm. that they made money yeah, on yeah. those cars. That's true. The amount of R and D that went into them, and the amount that they were selling them for. Like, I think they were probably more like, you know, uh, advertisements to be out on the street. It's actually, it's interesting that they weren't making money during that period because I actually think that was a pretty good period for their product. Well, it was the, great because during the 80s, they were flush with cash. Yeah, yeah. So all that money translated into, the, into all the 90s. Into 90s product. And early 2000s. Dude, but the, by, the second gen Pathfinder yeah. was a great truck. <laughs> The, the third gen Maxima, the SE Sport, the five speed with the white gauges, like that, that was great product. Yeah. Even like the first gen Altima was a pretty nice little car. Yeah. Like that wasn't a shitty car. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The Infinity in the 90s was had great product. They could never quite catch Lexus, but it was still any 90s Infinity at the time mm-hmm. was a really nice car. Yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't just Nissan. It was you know, all of Japan was going through a, a crippling recession at yeah, that time, yeah. and uh, you know, no no car company was immune to it. Nissan was just less well equipped than the others to like kind of bear that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, if it wasn't for Carlos Ghosn, that Nissan might not be around yeah. right now to um, to have lasted into the two thousands. And again, it's a miracle that R thirty five exists. Yeah, frankly, because he he was the one that was like, no, this is important. We're going through a restructuring, and we have basically no money but we like need to have a car like this like for national pride and company pride um and so i mean that's why i think 
GTR and Nissan will be, uh, or sorry, GTR and Japan will be tied together mm -hmm. like forever. Yeah, um, they really depend on each other and are reflections of each other. Speaking of which, it's it's so one of the things that just keeps coming up in your book is the number of people that aren't just willing to buy an R34 in Japan, but then but they do it spe with a specific intent, not just this is what I have to do in order to own one, but I'm going to do it this way specifically so I have an excuse to go to Japan and visit it and live out my, you know, initial D fantasies or whatever. And like that, you know, I, a lot of people said to me over the last few years, like, why haven't you bought an R34 in Japan? I'm like, because I don't want to, I don't want a car I can't drive. It, it didn't occur to me that, that, I mean, I could see why others would make a thing out of it, but it wasn't my fantasy. Sure. But I, but in the book, the the consistency of people's fantasies to not just own this car, but to drive it at the motherland. That'd be so cool. I mean, it would, would be, be cool. So cool. I've driven R30. I, I, I did the one and, for the yeah, drive film. I drove an R34 around Japan. Nice. We rented one from that fun to drive place. Did the Lewis Hamilton? Uh, it, I, oh, it might have been the same car. <laughs> I mean, like, I, I did it like two years awesome. before him, but it's totally possible that's it was awesome. the same car. It's like people that do European delivery of Porsche and sure. stuff like that. You yeah. know, then you get, it, it's exciting because you get to drive it in the environment in which it was developed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and I drove, I went to this trip in Japan. I drove an R35 uh, GTR Black Series or Track Edition or something. And then I drove the 34. And no, dis same trip, no disrespect to the 35. When I got in the 34, I was like, oh, this is the thing. Yeah. This is this is everything. This is the best. It was the right size, the right speed, the right everything yeah. for there. Yeah, it's um, a um, you know drivers built that car. Yeah, uh, it was it was centered around that. Yeah, um, from the beginning, it all was the such an amazing car. All the uh, third gen Skyline GTRs were, but that one in particular, like they really honed it in well. Yeah. Um, but to your to your earlier point, I think for a lot of them, like they frame, I'm going to own a GTR in Japan, and that's. Then they then they build the structure of their lives around that. <laughs> yeah. Like it's not like I'm gonna work work work, and then yeah. when I have money, I'll get something fun. No, in the like, book, you're like, yeah, you know, the car enthusiast might spend like thirty percent of their disposable income on the car. Like a GTR owner, it's a hundred percent. Oh, literally, <laughs> yeah. literally, yeah. And, uh, uh, a Nissan executive told me that, and then I asked people just like, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that's? I don't know if I'm gonna use this stat, whatever. And like, oh no, it's true. <laughs> 100% <laughs> true. I did it or he did it or I know people who did it. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. Folks, got to take one quick break because support for the smoking tire is coming at you from Factor. I love Factor. They send us food every month. It's in the fridge here at uh, WCCS where we record our show. And every time I get to that point where I work a little too long and start to panic because I'm too hungry, you know what's waiting for me in the fridge? Factor. It makes me eat on time so I don't make bad choices, eat fast food, eat bad food, and uh, they've got these pre-prepared, chef-crafted, dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. There's over 35 different options a week to choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan, veggie, and more, and there's over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons helping make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. Get started today and have a feel-good week of meals ready to go. It takes just two minutes to reheat Factor's restaurant-quality meals. Uh, they're ready whenever you are. There's the snacks. There's the smoothies. I love the smoothies, the strawberry banana. That's a good one. You can discover a wide variety of easy options to fuel up throughout the day, breakfast, midday bites, etc. Factor is the perfect solution if you're looking for fast upscale options done easily, save you from doing the dishes, save you from going to the store, save you from ordering unhealthy food uh, with one of those meal delivery services. Um, it's flexible. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing 6 to 18 meals per week. Plus, you can pause or reschedule deliveries at any time. You can head over to factormeals.com slash tire50 and use code tire50 to get 50% off. That's code tire50 at factormeals.com slash tire50 to get 50% off. And thank you to Factor for sponsoring today's show. Um, but I think uh, <laughs> so a lot of that, a lot of that owning it in Japan phenomenon is like their obsession with GTR is is intertwined with 
also an obsession of Japanese culture. And I don't know that that exists to that extent for another car. Like, I don't know if 911, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but I don't know if 911 owners are fans of that car because they're fans specifically of Germany and German culture and food and locations and travel I, and stuff I like mean, that. Casual observation, I'm going to say probably not. Yeah, and, and but it has to do with, you know, the type of pop culture that Japan puts mm-hmm. out and the anime and the manga and um, all these different things. Some of the guys were just obsessed with Godzilla, and they're like, well, the car's Godzilla, so I need to, so I need to have it. And, like, it's, it was just that simple. It was just like it was very childlike responses, but they just internalized it and in a lot of cases made it reality, which is yeah. like— Yeah, I mean, more than, in so, in, more than so many other cars— it, the GTR obsession and fandom, um, it really uh, demonstrates people's emotional connection to why they might want to buy a car. There's not, I mean, yes, they're fast. Like, they're, they're fast. You can make them fast. Like, they're good tuner cars. Got it. But, like, beyond that, it especially with the amount of money it costs to get a good R34 today, you're talking about true exotic car money and and more. Mm-hmm. I mean, so it, it could be three, four, five hundred thousand dollars. If you want to, if you want to M spec NUR or something, it could be up there. Mm-hmm. And so there's there's no longer an objective reason to spend that. But like people are about it. So those I mean, those people that are going after those today, I think it's a different it's a different class. Like anything that like grows exponentially in value, like it just a- attracts a different kind of person. So now these guys probably already have a couple GTRs and yeah. they don't have a NUR yet or, you know, whatever it is. They've got every Ferrari and but their kid likes <laughs> Skylines. Yeah, that was a funny not story impressed in the book by... <laughs> too. That's a very funny story in the book. The guy who's like his kid doesn't give a shit about his cars but like freaks out over a Skyline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, it wasn't even one of like the better quality you know, R33s in that example. But you're, so like, you're saying it's more the people that are spending 80 to 100 grand on like a rough R34 yeah. just to get in the game. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That's, uh, you know, 10 years ago, you didn't have to do that. Mm-hmm. They were, um, <laughs> one of the guys I talked to spent 12 grand on his and everyone thought he overpaid because they were like eight. Yeah. I read that time. and I got so sad because <laughs> I remember... Like six, seven years ago, when we, I think I was living with you, and we were just talking about GTRs, and my aunt had started working, living in Montreal, and I was like, I could buy one and just like put it there, but you know, I didn't have any money at the time. But I bet it would have been like twenty five thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. And now it's a hundred, two hundred. I, I bought a R thirty two GTR from Sean, mint, totally stock. Uh, I think it had forty thousand kilometers on it, for seventeen thousand four hundred dollars, in twenty fifteen. And I sold it for $45,000 a year later. Jesus. And I was like, I am the king. I'm a genius. I am so fucking smart. And the dude who I bought it from a year after that offered to sell it back to me for the same money. Oh. And I was like, no, thanks. And now that car is probably $90,000. Yeah, maybe. And, and I don't did, regret it. It's, it's fine. You kept it stock, right? I left it alone. Yeah, I didn't what did you it. What did you think of driving it? Because I, I think I mentioned it, but... Um, I, I talk to a lot of journalists just like mentioning it in mm-hmm. passing and it still gets derided quite a bit like, oh, that's just why it's not it's nothing special. It drives like an 80s car. Whatever, I, but I disagree with that. I felt it drove much closer to what was being sold as a BMW 335i at the time than it than anything from the 80s. I've owned every 80s car. A Countach, I have a fucking Ferrari. I have I've had air cooled Porsches. I had a Fox body. I've had every good 80s car. This was. 20 years ahead of that in every conceivable way. Now, it may not have been, it wasn't like mind-blowingly fast, but it drove beautifully. Yeah. I mean, really smooth, slick, buttery, great modern power band. I mean, you drive a 930 turbo and you drive one of these, it's like a different universe. Yeah. It was lovely. Yeah, I think the balance uh, and the kind of the like sensitivity to it yeah. is, is what sets it apart at the at the time for sure and then it doesn't take much to get power sure now having said that you know if i had kept it i probably wouldn't have kept it stock i could see how that over time would not maintain you know being interesting and the correct combination of parts which of course Sean 
is the expert. I mean, you can go on his website and it's like, here's how to make 400 horsepower. Here's how to make five. Here's how to make six. Here's how to make, like, it, there's a and formula. there's 50 companies you can go to. There's a formula. And so, like, the uh, the Built by Legends car, which was, like, four something at the wheels and, you know, 2,900 pounds, that's, I've, that's the best. Mm-hmm. That's the best it gets. Yeah. For me. And then I, we drove a R34 in New Zealand that was, like, 1,000 horsepower. <laughs> And that was crazy also in its own way, you know. Uh, I like twins. I don't like when they go to the single turbo. Mm-hmm. I like I like keeping it twins. And you can keep, you can run big power with the twins. And you could, sh- like Sean will tell you, you can run big power with stock airbox. Like, there's ways to do it. Um, they're great. They're they're very the the. the uh, they're very flexible. You could you can go this way. You can go. You build a drag car. You can build a track car. You can build a canyon car. You can build yeah. daily. Like Adam LZ just built a, built a rally car with his. Oh, that looks right. awesome! It's yeah, a real his, good he, job. Built, he did a safari build yeah. with his. It looks ridiculous. I haven't looked at it too closely, so I don't know what he just what, in the videos. What it he looks did rad. to it, but uh, it definitely looks cool. Yeah. But I, I'd love to know like what kind of stuff. He I would also like to know like what's the hardware, yeah. how well will it handle, whatever. <laughs> it do, it seems like a good time. Though. Yeah, yeah, but it's um. So what did you find to be the – I mean, you interviewed a lot of people. You went to Japan. You talked about the people behind the car, which is, I thought, a very cool bit of the book. You talked to owners and you talked to importers and you you, you went through the whole uh, – you call it a controversy of, of importing these things and taking them apart and putting them back together to get around laws. Like what did you find – Drew you in d- deepest into the research where you're like, oh, this this is the one I got to follow. Um, the the people who tried to get around the law, yeah, who tried to get around the 25 year law, um, and <laughs> found incredibly creative ways to do it, <laughs> including the legal one, which was the most complicated, yeah, of all. The show and display. No, uh, Motorex. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, which uh, so. Show and display is a very common way to bring them in, but you can only, I think it's 2,500 miles a year. Yeah. That's all you can drive it. Yeah. And it and has to be. It's there's... only the very rare variants, the exactly. sub variants. I think yeah. it's like maybe less than 500. Yeah. It has to be something like that. Um, so that's a legal way to bring it in. But Motorex uh, in the late 90s to, to <laughs> it's, it's unfathomable. The lengths they had to go to to legalize these things for importing it, I literally crash tested them um, and jumped through hoop after hoop of getting them crash tested, uh, emissions tested, um, and then the fact that they were able to legally do it. I think there's 110 uh, that they ended up doing that are still around, mm-hmm. they're still out there. Uh, yeah, that was the most fascinating part. But um, And then the fall of Motor X is I didn't fantastic. realize that, uh, uh, that you go a lot of depth about the fall of Motor X. I didn't know any of that. I just thought that, that they were, and I feel bad even saying this, because this is what I'm saying did not happen and is not true. I thought that they were saying cars had been converted that weren't converted, and they were sending them to customers. Now, that's not what happened. What happened was lots of financial impropriety and other stuff like that. I have not heard of that happening. I have heard of them saying they were working on things that they weren't working on, but they would just sit. Yeah. They would just sit on the lot. And that's in the book. That happened a couple couple people in the book. Yeah, but uh, um, what they also did was they got approved to import a very specific uh, type of, I think, R33. Yeah, it was 33, and then, 95 to 98 only. And then used that to bring in 32s and 34s. Now, Sean will tell you the cars are all basically the same. Uh, I think <laughs> it's an, it's it was in it was written into it that, like, you're not allowed to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so, but Sean at Top Rank, who, who I think is a, is a straight up, He's a straight up guy, um, but he worked at Motor X at yeah. the time. Yeah, yeah. And he and he was involved in helping get the legislation written that allowed them to to do the thing. Yes, thank you for saying that. Yeah. Um, and and you know we talked many times about Motor X, and he says, oh, as soon as I realized stuff was going sideways, I left. And I think he left in O two. So this was way before anybody had caught on that like some shady stuff was happening. Um, but yeah, eventually NHTSA realized, oh, we. Have we've been allowing this to happen? We're going to rescind that and slap a new uh, a new law on you that doesn't let you do that anymore. And that was, I mean, that would have killed their business anyway. And yeah. then um, it had been being run in a financially untoward way. So they were they were 
out of there anyway. And but I, uh, it was a lot of fun detailing the, the lawsuit that I think dealt them the, the the final blow. The military guy and his and his his uh, missing car. Yeah. So unfortunately, yeah. it was a lot of military people that ended up getting screwed over uh, by Motorex and you know by by in the GTR world in general. I think because. A lot of them are stationed overseas. They know about the car. They have access to the car. They decide they want to bring it in. People tell them, oh, I can do that for you. It's easy. Just mm-hmm. give me this much money. Um, and they were taken advantage of pretty regularly. But this one in particular uh, sent two cars, I think both are 32s to Hero at Motorex and then waited sometimes months for like updates and sent them, sent them money and um, I think it was something close to $20,000. And... At the time, which at the time was plus a ton. the cars. Yeah, the cars were like fifteen thousand dollar cars then yeah. for a nice R thirty two. Yeah, um, would wait months, three months, six months at a time. Meanwhile, he's like being uh, stationed to, like in Afghanistan. Yeah, like to fight the war on terror. Yeah, at the Hero's time. like, well, what's this guy gonna do? He's in the fucking <laughs> exactly. desert. He's in Afghanistan. Hero, Hero like, just parked his cars in the back of the lot and never touched them and yeah. said, oh, they'll be ready when you get back. And yeah. they, were, they were never ready. So finally, he just got mad enough and hired a lawyer who is the one who found out about this discrepancy in the yeah. law and, and ultimately took him down. And uh, the the day that really ended Motorex, um, uh, kind of officially was when that um, serviceman was able to just roll up and <laughs> take his car. Say, These are my cars. I'm taking them. And he left. And that that essentially started a free for all for yeah. everybody to grab their cars back. Yeah. And and the what the guy's lawyer found was that Motorex said, yes, we can federalize your car. But there was actually no way they could do it because the R32 is a non-airbag car. The reason Motorex was able to get approval for 95 to 98 cars was because they had the same airbag as the U.S. market cars have. Yes. Those R33 cars have the ugly airbag wheel, and it's the same airbag wheel they used in America. So like, oh, it's the same, it's the same thing. And although Sean uh, you know, may be right that the structurally the cars are all the same for crash testing, you can't put an R33 airbag system into an R32 yeah. and have it work the same way. Yeah. So, and, and so they shouldn't have taken these guys' cars correct. and said that they could do it because there was no way they could do it. Yeah. So the lawyer argued that when Hero agreed to do that work, knowing that it was fraud. Yeah. Um, Which it probably was. Probably was. It probably was. Yeah. But now, interestingly enough, for a long time, so the the government, uh, although they shut down the importation business, they allowed, I don't know what's the exact term, they allowed everyone to keep their cars yeah, at, they, in, they, in America. They, the ones that were already here, they grandfathered them. Because in. they, in good faith, paid Motorex to do what they thought was legal. Correct. Which the government, it's a very rare thing that they would do that. Yeah. I mean, look. The government's role in this whole story is pretty hilarious because they put down these very clear laws with like often very uh, stiff penalties. But then when it actually comes to the thing happening, uh, they make a big show of like press releases and like get headlines and stuff. And then there are often like very little repercussions. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so, like uh, like with Kaizo. <laughs> with Kaizo, with Kaizo, which was which was another crazy fucking story, <laughs> and I found one of those cars back in the day yeah, when I've, I was shopping for cars. I've seen a few, and I sent it to I sent it to Sean. I go, hey man, <laughs> what's a Nissani? What's it? What? And he goes, oh, it's a Kaizo car. Run. He said, let me tell you a story. <laughs> yeah. So can, can you tell us this? Give us the quick story of the Kaizo car, which is which is also in the book. It's very funny. Uh, in the mid-2000s, there was a um, Orange County, I believe, sheriff's deputy uh, named Daryl Allison. And he started – he was a big enthusiast, and he started a company called Kaizo Industries. I think Kaizo means modified yeah. in Japan, in Japanese. Um, so he said, okay. So when I said there are a lot of different ways people brought cars into the country, this is a great illustration. The Kaizo one is the funniest one. The Kaizo probably. one is the funniest. So uh, – you are allowed to bring in a shell of uh, an illegal car. You are also allowed to bring in the powertrain of an illegal car. You are not allowed to join them together whatsoever. Like that is very explicitly yeah. laid out. You can bring in the parts yeah. as long as they don't become a car again on this side. And especially if you are mating them to exactly the 
the way that they were built and the yeah, fact yeah. that you're like, if you don't even like switch them out yeah. to like a different shell, like you just put it right back. Uh, that's what essentially he was doing. And then rebadging them as either Kaizo cars or Nissani yeah. cars with an I on the end. Uh, so you're also tampering with the VIN. Yeah. Which is <laughs> <laughs> And it was it was some like, oh, it's a kit car. Yeah. But like it's not. It's like you just disassembled a car so and then put it back. These together. are <laughs> some of these are the cars that ended up in Fast and Furious four, uh-huh. I believe. Um and is the quote unquote Paul Walker car that I think sold at Bonham's in twenty twenty three for over a million dollars. Yeah. Oh, was it Kaizo? That's a Kaizo. Yeah. Oh, was it really? Yeah, I just it, never, it never belonged to Walker. Here, wait. It was the one that he... Oh, it is a Kaizo. It, it, was, like it was the one that surprised. he spec'd out to what he wanted uh-huh. in a GTR, but it never belonged to him. Oh, okay. So does that mean that this car... So that's why someone... it now says driven by Paul Walker. When they first put this listing up, it, it said owned? the Paul Walker. Oh. But if GTR. someone buy, buys this car, or the person that bought this for $1.4 million, does that mean the government's looking for it and might throw it away because but does I, I don't know that it's here. Gotcha. Yeah, it was. Like, it could be yeah. glo- globally, like... Yeah. You cannot drive a Kaizo car on the road in America. Oh yeah, they uh, they they have a registry. Uh, I don't know. I don't know that they know where they all are, but they they know you know how to identify them if they do come across them. Wow. So, yeah, but like they're... I found one on Craigslist. Like literally, <laughs> Craigslist. I've, yeah, oh, in <laughs> California, in California, a, an R33. So the VIN plate didn't say Kaizo Industries. It said Nissani Motors, mm-hmm. and I was like. What the fuck is that? I had never heard of it. And I sent it to Sean, and he was like, "Kaizo, run." Yeah. It's like, okay. I think the remember back in the day, like fifteen years ago, when people were having a panic that the government was gonna was looking to seize cars. Yeah. I think that was these cars. It was. It was the Kaizo cars. It wasn't Motor X cars. Uh, yeah, you're right. Right. You're right. It yeah. was Kaizo that kind of set off a fury. But um, yeah. to, to just to wrap up what we were talking about, the eventually, because of the movies, the government realized that how these were getting into the country. Uh, they were also doing lots of articles on Kaizo and Daryl at the time. <laughs> For some reason, he was allowing that to happen. Uh, so they raided his facility and took all the cars and everything. And he was facing serious, serious time. Uh you know, they had like a laundry list of conspiracy and fraud and um, defrauding the EPA, which like they bring the hammer down for that. And, uh, you know, authorities gave some pretty strong, strongly worded quotes to newspapers saying like, everyone thinks this is a joke, but this is not a joke and justice will be given out. And then he, he got like six months probation. Yeah, and, <laughs> like nothing. And like, like a small he, fine. He yeah. Just got nothing. Um, similar thing. Uh not to spoil my own book, but uh, one of the threads in the book is that Miami couple, the husband and wife team, mm-hmm. who uh, during the 2010s were bringing in JDM cars. Sorry, they weren't bringing them in. They had a, a partner company that was bringing them in, which they m- mentioned their name in court, but I'm not going to say it because I'm working on that story still. Um, so this couple was titling and uh, registering, quote unquote, JDM cars, which are not allowed to be titled and registered here, uh, they were just forging everything <laughs> and like more than 300 cars. Now, each time you do that for one car, it's a felony. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's not great. They sent them to Mars. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not good. Yeah. Uh, but I, and uh, court hearings and proceedings went on for a year and a half. So the entirety that I was researching and writing this book, I didn't get to put in the conclusion. Um, but it just wrapped up in yeah, yeah, early that's December. True. It did, it, okay, so there is a conclusion to the story. Yeah. So okay, they so were, this is a part two so of So they book. kept stalling, 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 and the judge was like, look, trial is starting. First week in December, settle or be ready. And uh, so they scheduled a hearing like two days before trial was supposed to start. And they're like, we settled. We, we made a deal. And I was like, oh, boy, here we go. Like, yeah. What's it going to be? And they were like... Five years probation, no jail time. God damn it. $10,000 fine. You can commit so many <laughs> felonies in this you country and not go to jail. You can't work in titling oh. or registering again. And but, but That's like not a punishment. They got to walk out. That's crazy for 300 title fraud penalties. That's wild. That's so crazy. It's wild, but I think I'm glad I'd, I know how that ends because in the book, y- you mentioned that it's you know at, at press time, it's still working its way through the court system, yeah. and and there's a lot of detail on the story and the stuff they were doing is crazy. So although you did just give us the bones of it, there's a lot worth reading in the book. But yeah. I'm glad that I'm glad to know that justice was not served. Well, it's <laughs> like well, what are what are we doing here then? 
Yeah. Like what is what is the point mm-hmm. of all this? Like you're putting in you're putting in these these laws that affect people or force them to go to outside means with no other way to do it. Yeah. Like you're only giving them that option to do it, but then and then you make a big show of like humiliation and public embarrassment and all that stuff. But then when it actually comes to doing something, it doesn't seem like you really care about it. Yeah, or you're much. just or yeah, or the or the you don't have what you say you have. Yeah. You know. But it seems like now with the hindsight of what's happened to these people, it seems like the whole law was really about that. 80s European business at that time, yeah. and it's just not relevant to today's economy. Yeah, I think I think that's probably right. Uh, yeah, the, the gray market just doesn't exist yeah. in the way that it did um, back then. And uh, and also, yeah. I think it's it doesn't. It's one thing if if a if a business is existing to sell you the same car that you could buy from a dealer here. But by buying it in a different country and shipping it here, mm-hmm. you know, versus uh, by and getting a few enthusiasts cars that are not sold here, were never sold here. You can't go to a Nissan dealer and get an, and get a Skyline. This is the only way you can get one. It's a small number of cars, and like, what the fuck are we, you know? That's not a, that's not a significant statistic for anybody. Yeah, it's a small it's a small number. Yeah, and uh, I think. <laughs> The whole, the whole book, I think, is a story of unintended consequences. <laughs> like, well, we didn't know that was going to happen. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. uh, we didn't know you were going to just put them in shipping containers and bring them over. Yeah. Well, like, that was the only option you gave people. And then, you know, well, we didn't know this was going to turn into a $300,000 car. Well, you created scarcity. Yeah. Like, this is <laughs> – Yeah. It just, hype, it just cracked me up. Like, and scarcity. Every time somebody tried to, like <laughs> – create a blockage like people find their way around it when there's this much desire and this much like attention on something they're gonna find a way to do it mm-hmm. um yeah it's really what did you stuff. find was the most i mean other than the fact that they spent 100 percent of their disposable income on the cars were there other consistencies between the people who collected or were very passionate about skylines like other through lines um that they never considered another option. They never mm-hmm. considered another outcome. It was like this is this is what's going to happen. Um, or like I said, that they were influenced by you know all the same things. Yeah, the people who want a skyline are not objectively they're not, shopping. They're going, well, I'll get a skyline, or I'll get this, or yeah. I'll get this. Like Zach, Zach posted uh, or on his Instagram this morning that he had finished the book and was like. I want a Skyline now. And I saw someone commented like, oh, there's like all these other cars that you could get for that much money. And I was like, that dude's not in the book. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that is not what any of this is about. Yeah. Nobody's really cr- book, yeah. No one's cross shopping. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. not with, uh, I mean, even with the Supra, like it's just not, it's mm-hmm. not the same. Like they're super people and just like all the, I mean, it's, it's, it's a story as old as car culture. Like there are Mustang people and Camaro people and um, I don't know how many people switch from one to the other like it's kind of the same thing sure what did you uh was it real crazy to go to japan and roll around in the r32 midnight club uh uh with the father of the skyline uh yeah yeah midnight club your words not mine uh sorry midnight racing oh no no i'm sorry i'm I'm just saying like involvement wise right right right. um but but yeah look (laughs) <laughs> I spent some time with Hiroshi Tamura, who's the head of the Z and GTR program at Nissan uh, currently and has been for, for many years, uh, both in the U.S. and in Japan. And in Japan, uh, he offered to take me around in a ride for where, in his R32 GTR that he's owned since new. Um, it's got a Race Team Midnight sticker on the front and on the back, so make of that what you will. But uh, it was just... It was a total roller coaster. It was super fun. And uh, like he just has a very, he only, he has just pinches the steering wheel like very delicately. Um, but you're going so fast and like <laughs> moving so quickly. Um, he knows these streets like the back of his hand. He knows that car like the back of his hand. Um, and it was just making all the fun noises, all the whooshes, uh, all the flutters. Um, and it was, it was just uh, a great experience to be like, 
this is something that people dream about. And uh, to be able to see him handle that car on those streets in person, um, I hope I hope that it conveyed on the pages because it was uh, it was it was something I'll remember for a long time. Do those folks give much thought to the R35 GTR, or is it not? It's not really for them. Uh, no, they they value it very highly. I think. I mean, that was that was. I mean, I was I was gonna say it was his baby. It wasn't his baby. They uh, he worked very closely with um, another manager who like was the head of the project. But um, the R35 is very near and dear to even died in the wool like Skyline people. Like just because it's not manual um, or not an inline six, like or not an RB engine. Um, they see it as a continuation. That's why I'm really curious to see what's going to happen with what comes next. Um, I think the Hyperforce is really fun. That concept car that they put out that's got crazy super silhouette inspired fenders and stuff um, and is most likely going to lead to an electrified yeah. slash hybrid slash fully electric whatever GTR in the future. Um, but I, I, think, I think GTR people will pout a little bit and then they'll get with the program and they'll love it just mm -hmm. like they love all the other ones because the whole the whole point of this car is like hitting above its weight sure like you're supposed to uh it's supposed to be able to blow the doors off of everything that is in its price range yeah and compete like several levels above r35 absolutely does that and uh especially when it first came out like it it was just it was a uh, Unprecedented, which you could get for I think at the time it was seventy five grand. Yeah, yeah I mean, it was great. half the price of a, like a, of a turbo, 911 yeah. turbo, and it was right with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And now, but at even the time, it, we're talking about a nine nine seven turbo, only available. You know, it was available with an auto, but but the one we're talking about is a manual. Yeah. You know, and let's see, oh seven, that would have been a Ferrari four thirty. I mean, there's been some. You, go, you know, go from the Ferrari four thirty to the two nine six Assetto Fiorano, and they're still making the same car. You yeah. know, it's, we're, it's, we're almost at twenty years yeah. of R thirty five. And it's yeah. like the one I the one I drove two years ago, the Nissan Press car was like one hundred ninety thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. It's I was got like, well very, now <laughs> we're a little over our Nissan? skis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There yeah. was the T. Was the most recent one, right? The T spec or something? T spec is the yeah. new one, but uh, I was just saying. I drove the Nismo, yeah. Oh, the Nismo. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, those are cool because they're like track weapons. Um, it was cool, but, but I was just like that's a lot of money. The amount of money it hasn't changed that much. A lot of the hardware. I mean, they they got really creative in the press release with what had changed about the engine. It was yeah. like a manifold design, but power is the same, transmission is basically the same, and and you know inflation accounts for some of this, but also the price creep of cars in general. But when we're looking at a 2012, a 2013, yeah. a 2014, and they all look basically the same. And they perform very similarly, and then the price creep hasn't, and the performance ha hasn't caught up or kept up with the competition. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think I think similarly, you know, just like in the 90s, it uh, the amount of investment that they're able to put into the car is reflective of how yeah. the company and, and the global economy is doing, and. Uh, I think that's why you have a R35 that lasts for 20 years. Yeah, they, yeah. I mean, they had a bad time. Everyone had a bad time in 09, 10, 11. I think they had one Which of is the when the car came out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They came out and they immediately sold none of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, I, I get it. But uh, for me, the the that ethos, it, it makes sense. Yeah. But the, you know... I've driven all the older ones, the 32, and, and they're just so fun. Yeah. You know, because they have that tech... But they still are so engaging in such a such a great way that they're such like drivers' cars. Whereas the R thirty five is it puts all the numbers down, but to me it's just like not a driver's car. It's big and heavy, and and it 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 puts numbers on a page, but it just doesn't engage me in the same way. And it's have you driven a Nismo Z yet? No. So. God damn, it drives me nuts because they did so many right things in that car. So many. The steering and, like, the fucking hunkered down chassis and the brakes are all, like, fucking best in class. They're all of it. And then they're like, well, we put it, it's, all, it's only automatic because lap times. And it's like, dude, who's spending 70 grand on a Z because of lap times? Like, yeah. stop it. GT3 Touring Manual. $240,000. Can't keep them in the fucking store. 
hundred over. Like, what are we doing here, guys? Yeah, and the feel. Yeah, and the lap times is not is not really the point. Well, for in for our performance like car of the year test, we had a Mustang Dark Horse and a BMW M2, which were about four thousand dollars more than the Z, both with manuals. Both smoked it on the track. Mm. So, like, your rationale stinks, guys. Yeah, I mean, they'll probably come out with a manual. They probably will. And the, to their credit, the people at Nissan, when we're at the launch, I bitched to them. And they're like, if the demand is there, we can put it in, you know, later. And I hope they will. They did it with the Supra, you know. But they they could have just offered it now. Yeah. Yeah, I don't <laughs> know. I don't know what the reasoning yeah. was there. I'm sure uh, – I'm knowing some Nissan people, I'm sure there were fights. <laughs> there, he, no, they did. They said there were fights. The guy was like, believe me, like half the people in this room are 100% with you and can't say shit. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I, I really enjoyed the manual Supra. Like, I thought manual that was, Supra was fun. I thought that was a lot of fun. Yeah, much more fun than the automatic. Yeah. Changes the co- whole character of the car. I thought so, too. I'm even excited for the Z4 manual. Oh, they're doing the Z4 manual? Yeah, this year. Oh. Yeah. Press cars come out in March. Oh, I like that. And it's got some fun German word for... Manual, it's called like hand shafting or something. It means like, <laughs> it's got a word. What's the word, Zach? The Z4 manual, they called it, uh, where is it? The car and driver, it's called like hand shafting or something. I don't know. That's I just, great. I'm sure I just fucked it up. It's a word that sounds vaguely sexual and masturbatory, but it means manual gearbox. That's great. Yeah. Um, do you think we, uh, I was going to say, do you think we rushed to judgment on the Supra? I mean, I guess you can no. only judge what, what when it came out. In what regard? What do you mean? Like, like I didn't think I didn't think it deserved a lot of the <laughs> vitriol that it got. The automatic one, even because just of, because it was an automatic, or no, what, I think I think um, what people specific? were just disappointed in what like in what it ultimately came out as. But I thought I always thought it had good bones, and I always thought uh, like it had the ability to quickly make a lot of power. And you see them like. At grid life and and being used they're, on the true. track, like they're people are people are vehicles, yeah. taking these things and you know you might have to upgrade it a bit, but there's a lot of performance to unlock in there. And I so reviewed I a time attack it, one, and the guy's been running it for like over a year. Like he time attacks a lot, and it just runs fine. It's automatic. It's mild mods. I mean, it holds up. I was definitely one of the people in the beginning who was kind of annoyed, like this isn't a Toyota. And so, and one of the great things about the Supra, like, is that it's incredibly reliable. There's these really high mileage examples, you know, simple, like the parts are, I don't want to say the parts are affordable, but like the 2J is a legendary engine and the whole structure you know is going to hold together. The whole thing is well built. It's like and legendarily overbuilt. It's, exactly. In, in the it's way like the that only a 90s Toyota could be. Right. But now we know that yeah. we're getting modern BMW where obsolescence is frequent or maintenance trips can be frequent. And you go, okay, well, that's not. There are things about the old Supra that will not happen in the new one. And mm-hmm. I think for a lot of people, that was a kind of a bummer. But but engine to engine, they're inline sixes. They're both incredibly powerful. They're pretty robust. They take to mods like fish to water. So there are definitely similarities, and they've been performing really well on the track. And then I mean, we, when we drove the manual one, it had a better shifter feel than the BMW equivalent. Yeah, it does. Like, holy shit. So it's, it's a fun car to drive for sure. When I went on the launch, I thought it was pretty good, actually. And then I had one for Performance Car of the Year 2020, and in a comparison test, it was not good. Mm. So I, my first impression was, oh, this is all right. And in isolation, it was. But back to back with other great cars, it really did not stack up at that time. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just wonder how we're going to look back on it in a while. We, because... I started to see a lot of them on the street. I yeah. think people, I think now that they've built up enough cars and and there's no longer huge markups to get them or anything like that you can really walk in and for 55 grand get a good performance car i think they'll sell them yeah. on the plus side if you want a bmw m3 that doesn't look like an m3 <laughs> yeah. you can get a supra yeah. Yeah. yeah that's a good point um i i also just think like well that was the only way we were going to get a supra mm-hmm. sure it's like that's it's the same thing they did with the 86 and the brz um and Toyota really wants to build up this GR brand. So if they're going to do that, like the best way to do that, to bring attention to it is by bringing out a Supra. Yeah. And, you know, I understand that it's it's not exactly what we all remember it being. But, um, you know, you got to look at what they're trying to build there. And they're trying to build long-term, like, viability for the well, GR brand. Well, have you driven brand. a yeah. stock Mark IV Supra recently? 
that isn't what you remember it being. Yeah, it's exactly. A but soft car. That's the point. Yeah, yeah. But like, well, but that's how we're judging the stock. Yeah, super yeah. now is like, well, the 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 thing that made people fall in love with the Mark IV was how you could turn it into sure. something True. incredible. Yeah, and like, you didn't you didn't judge it by how it came off the floor. Yeah. So, anyway. Um, yeah, we got a bunch in the Patreon. Let's get to some of those. Uh, of course, if you want to ask questions of our uh, guests or us for the show, patreon.com slash the Smoking Tire Podcast. You can also get an ad-free listening experience, get the show ahead of time, um, and get a bunch of other good stuff, including some patron today is going to get uh, shipped to them a Wangen Edition copy of of Cult of GTR, which Ryan has brought us uh, today. And I will also include my copy. I read it. I, I'm going to pass along the love. Wow. I don't I don't put them on my shelf afterwards uh, when someone could get a good read out of this. So this one's addressed to me. And uh, and then we'll give another one away. This one, you, we need to make sure you sign this one. For sure. Um, and we'll give this one uh, in the Patreon. So when we get this show up uh, early in, uh, in the Patreon, uh, if you want one, first commenter that wants the book, U.S. shipping only. Uh, I'm not sending that shit to England. <laughs> <laughs> U.S. shipping only will get a copy of the Wangen edition, uh, Cult of GTR. Second person will get my personal copy. And uh, I didn't know how many GTR fans they were in Germany until I started getting orders. Oh, I'm really? Like, oh, this is going to be great oh, shipping wise that'll be fun <laughs> but I, uh, I thank you i appreciate you all sure. <laughs> uh let's see all the pizza in my belly says not directly gtr related but why didn't subaru make a true halo car in the 90s the 22b seems about as close as they came uh can't think of another major jdm player that stayed on the sidelines i would say the 22b is pretty goddamn close pretty cool good question maybe it's another book uh no, I don't know. I think that that's a pretty small manufacturer. Uh, when we're talking about Honda, Toyota, Nissan, like Subaru and and Mitsubishi, Mazda, like those are pretty small in comparison. They probably didn't have the the finances to throw around into something. I don't even know, like like a like a Supra esque. Um, right. I mean, the SVX. 91 and 90, 96. That was like supposed to be kind of a halo yeah. car, but it just, they couldn't do it. Right. Couldn't get it done. And that was also in the middle of uh, the Japanese stock market falling apart. <laughs> it was, yeah. Right? So, yeah. like, so they lost their funding. Everyone lost their funding. As, yeah. as you're saying, the development happened mid to late 80s. Yeah. So if they weren't, if they didn't have big money bags by then, they weren't going to have them in the 90s. Does it feel like we're seeing more SVXs lately? Them before I don't. I don't. I mean, I don't. Do you see a lot of SVXs? Kind of, yeah. Really? Like, it, I guess it. At car shows, but like sometimes just driving around, and I'm like, when did this happen? I don't know. Maybe there's it's just too more bad they were all automatic because they're they're really neat looking. Yeah, Jajaro, it's it's cool stuff. They're the double windows, yeah, they're funky. Cool. They're yeah. great until you need to use a car <laughs> with them. Then they're not good. <laughs> Ask me how I know that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I'm a, I'm. We talked about uh, JDM a bunch two shows ago, and I'm a big fan of the two door STI. Jade, Japanese market cars mm -hmm. and even the 2.5 RS when you you can Legos out that fucking powertrain and build yourself an RSTI they're fun yeah the great thing about pretty much all Japanese cars is like they're they're kind of a blank slate and you can like they're intended for you to tune them and upgrade them and and mod them mm -hmm. um, and and like you said they're pretty regularly overbuilt to yeah. be able to handle whatever you want to throw at them yeah yeah um, was it just these two, Zach? Oh, I guess what happens when you do t two shows in a day. Commenters only have the appetite to ask questions for the first one. Uh, Tim says, how cheap would first-gen Tycons have to be before you would throw caution to the wind and buy one? Would the risk of an electronic and mechanical nightmare be worth a gamble at a certain price? Not to me. I, I, just, I just don't know. The battery thing, like when I'm driving – electric press cars around and stop and to shoot and people come up and ask about it or whatever the number one thing they ask is how long is the battery going to last yeah I'm like i have no idea i don't know what to tell you nobody does and and they're like oh well what do you do what do you recommend to do when it's done and i'm like i have no idea <laughs> yeah my aunt uh had a first gen volt and loved it loved it so much and then one day the battery just gone and she had, had no nothing to do no recourse so she just like sold it for you know, almost like nothing. Scrap, yeah. basically, right? Um, so I don't know. That. I'm a big proponent of EVs. I think it's the right way to go. 
Um, I think if we get the infrastructure to catch up to what we need, it it really solves a lot of problems. What do you do about <laughs> the batteries that are have nothing left? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, there are there are some businesses that are set up to. So two questions: What do you, the consumer, do if you are now if you want to buy a used car and you're concerned about battery life? And what does you, society, do yeah. about batteries that can no longer power a car? Uh, the second part of that, society, there are businesses set up to recycle batteries. And what does that mean? It means you take the cells out, you test them, and the cells that are good can be repurposed for other things. For instance, um, home power storage, uh, battery packs for like RVs and trailers where they don't necessarily have to power the motion of the vehicle, but like it takes a ton of energy to make something really heavy move. It does not take a ton of energy to power LED lights for several days. So you could have a battery pack that weighs a couple hundred pounds that will power your electronics on your RV for a while. You plug it in at home and it's and and that can be made of recycled stuff. Um, so that's what society might do. So now, if, we, if we can get that to happen at scale. Yeah. But I, I don't imagine that it's happening in large It's not happening quantities. at scale right now. Yeah. But it's but a developing industry. It's a developing yeah. industry, and there are people trying to make it work in good faith. Yeah. Um, there's also people that those same companies are recycling the, the waste metals and the waste stuff that comes from the process of making the batteries, capturing that and, and doing the same thing. Now, what do you, the consumer, do? Yeah. Uh... No idea. Yeah. You're host. And I think it's state to state. My brother's shopping for used plugins right now. And some, you know, some states will have like a battery warranty where mm -hmm. like the state goes, you have to be guaranteed a 10 year life term. And if it dies, then it gets replaced under like a subsidy or something. But if you're in a state that doesn't have that, then you could buy a used Volt and two years later, the battery stops working and then you're just fucked, which yeah. sucks. Yeah. Yeah. There's, I think we've got to figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's just like, I think we know the problems we're facing and I think there are solutions to them. It's just going to take like <laughs> a lot of effort yeah. to get to them. But I, the the thing that makes me optimistic about EVs, even with all the like bad headlines in the last few weeks, months, whatever, uh, is like we do know the road to it. We're just not really willing right now to spend what it's going to take to fix some of this stuff. Yeah. But um, yeah, like an energy source that you can get from the sun. Like I think it would be silly to not pursue that. I just read a crazy article that. about this. About this. Uh, a, a family farm in like I think it was Kansas or something, and it was like 1,500 acres, and they, you know, the the people who own it are getting old. They've owned the land since like the 1800s, like five six generations of people. They've farmed it. The soil's not great anymore, and they want and they leased it to a solar company. Okay, but the town went batshit, <laughs> and there's hearings and all this stuff and. It's a nuisance. It's going to be this. We we and it was and 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 these people, yeah. A lot of time they they kind of they were so mad and they were like they were all like we agree with solar. We just don't want to look at it. And it's like well, sooner it's like nimbyism. You know, like we agree that homeless people should have low income housing, but not near my house. Yeah. We agree or even, that, or, or even like, well, you can't build apartments yeah, in the neighborhood. Right? Right. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's that cra it's just crazy. Yeah. Like, you, God forbid you have to see an apartment building from yeah. your property. And so they, they, they were all talking about how they didn't want to ruin the look of their very rural, you know, the rolling fields of wherever it was. And it was like, th this shit has to go somewhere. Yeah. Like, someone's going to have to look at this. And I just... It, as long as there are people that don't want to look at stuff, we're in a world of hurt, man. <laughs> <laughs> like, all right, I guess we'll just go down the road we're currently right. on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right, of course. <laughs> That's working out. <laughs> Atmospheric River every <laughs> six great. months. That's yeah. good. Let's Excellent. do that. Um, this book made me want to buy another GTR. Did writing it make you want to buy a GTR, or was it just a fun story that you were mentally able to move on from? Did when you, you buy one and it's sitting? Did you buy one while you were there? Is that really <laughs> why you went to Top Rank yep. in Japan? Exactly. Um, 
I think it's it's gotten so out of control. It's just it's fun to it's fun to watch uh, at this point, and um, I love the community. The guys are and, and ladies are fantastic. Um, so I'll I'll be a big fan forever. Um, it's yeah, the the actual GTR market has just gotten insane. But I I kind of like like four door skylines. Like They're cool. R three twos and R three threes. Yes, that's what Zach was talking about. Those the, are the sweet four doors. Looking. Yeah, like they just look cool. But I think I'm just getting old because I like sedans in general now. Like I think they look cool too. Them, they're rad. Unnecessarily old barges like from the '90s and stuff. Like uh, yeah, but uh, you don't want it to be a barge. You want it to be drifto. Yeah, see, I Drift think they're, I think they're a good time for that. My uh, what's the wheelbase on that? My grandparents live in Kansas. I'm from Kansas originally, and um, uh, they would just buy like big sedans and then replace them with with more. So at one point they had a Crown Vic and a Grand Marquis <laughs> and something else uh, from GM. I don't remember what it, what it was at the time. Uh, but every time I think about it, I'm like, I kind of want that. A fleet now. of big sedans. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. sounds fun. I've been really enjoying my giant Bentley. Oh my god, the ultimate it's fucking that's the that's the big sedan big of big sedans. Yeah. Yeah, it's delightful. I get it. I like that. We'll see. Um and uh you also brought a pre uh pre pro copy. We'll just plug it. When is this out? Uh this will be out late March, early April. Um the book is called We Deserve This. So I started the publishing company uh for my books. And uh, as like a result of that, I get, shit. To, I get to make whatever I want. Which Does that also rad. mean you have to personally ship those copies to yes. Germany? Is that why you said that? Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. If anyone knows, uh, you know, workarounds about shipping and stuff, <laughs> reach out to me. But uh, it's all good. But yeah, I get to I get to make fun projects, and so this is a uh, something that I'm doing with Victoria Scott, the journalist and photographer, and she put together an incredible. Um, coffee table photo book of uh, transgender auto enthusiasts and uh, their cars. So we're very excited to be bringing that out very soon. Yeah, it's a cool book. We love Victoria. She came to visit us with her uh, Japanese van when she was road tripping. Uh, great writer um, and uh, has done some good things. And, and I'm excited to see this book. I will be uh, I will be a customer. I will be buying one. And uh, I'm sure, is she going to do the book tour? We're working on it. All right, cool. We'll yep. get her. We'll get her back in here, um, and uh, so that's very cool. Happy to see that that being a real thing. Um, all right, thanks to our patrons for uh, chatting uh, today. Thank you uh, to all of you for listening. Thanks to Ryan. We really did like the book. It was a lot of fun. Blasted through it in two days, and happy to pass it along so someone else can read it. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks.